When I had come down this hill, I had seen this creature cross the road. It would have ripped my locked door from my truck, extracted me from my vehicle, and there wouldn't have been a damn thing I could have done about it. This thing, I got to notice in its eyes. Its eyes was real, real evil, real sinister looking. You know, the look it was giving me. Welcome to Bigfoot Hotspot Radio, Sasquatch Chronicles. I'm your host, Wes, along with my brother, Woody, and researcher, author, and friend, William Jeppy. Let's start the show. In 1975, in Spotsville, Kentucky, The Nunley family home was terrorized by a mysterious eight-foot-tall creature. Over 35 years ago, and I remember like it was was yesterday, what I remember most was the fear that we all felt when these things came around, and it was the first time that I'd ever seen my dad scared of anything. I heard a bunch of limbs breaking, coming through the woods, like something coming through the woods, some large coming through the woods. And all of a sudden, everything got real quiet. And I looked over to the edge of the woods, and he, he was standing right in the little gully, right outside of the woods, just standing there watching us. I couldn't, I couldn't even speak. I was so scared. I knew they were there. I didn't know what they were. But I knew that they were, they were not figments of our imagination because it, it killed all of our animals. This place is probably the the number one spot where these creatures like to hang out for whatever reason. And there was this thing standing right directly under that light. What that thing is, I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing, it's eerie. I don't care what you believe. My eyes seen it. And I'm not the only one that's seen it, and I don't care whether you believe me or not, I know it's true. So help me God, that is true. After the creature killed the family's pets and livestock, it seemed to be lured in while the children were playing. The family was terrified for their lives. You better believe it. The family decided to take matters into their own hands. Four armed men climbed to the roof of the family's home and waited. The creature was seen exiting the barn.
This is their story. Well, I want to welcome to the show Bart Nunley. He is the author of two books, Mysterious Kentucky and Bigfoot in Kentucky, and they're both available on the Kindle right now. So I wanted to go ahead and welcome Bart to the show for our part two of the Spotsville Monster. Hey, and thanks for having me, Wes. It's a pleasure. Hi, Bart. How are you? How are you today? I'm good, Will. How about yourself? I'm doing just fine. Thank you. Okay, so you've had actually quite a few experiences from what I understand. Is that correct? Yes, yes, I have. I've seen it twice, Will, and uh, encountered it two or three more times where, where I didn't see it. How long and ago? And those were actually a lot scarier than the one, the encounters that I had when I saw the creature. Sure. How long ago did all this begin? It all began back in 1975, so okay. 39 years ago. So let's go ahead and start there. and. Tell us about the events that led up to your first encounter that particular day. Well, we had uh, we moved into a, an isolated farmhouse we along the Green River in, uh, here in western Kentucky, Henderson County, uh, just outside of Spotsville in a little town called Basket. And at first, everything was great. You know, we had all kinds of fruit trees. We had apple trees, peach trees, pear trees, persimmons, mulberries, cherry trees. We had uh, wild strawberries growing out behind the barn. It was a really an idyllic uh, situation for my family because, you know, we've, we've always been from the country and uh, we were moving back from the city. And it was really good for my brother and I. We, we like to hunt arrowheads in the fields, you know, outside. And this place here had all that and right next to the river. And it had a, a burial mound, old Indian burial mound on it. We just, we was just really, it was like a paradise for us there at the beginning, but then, you know, some of our animals started disappearing. Uh, Dad's chickens started disappearing, and he just blamed it on weasels and stuff like that, and didn't think much of it. But, uh, then one night out in the, while they were sitting tomato plants, my mother saw this creature run and, uh, jump over a fence. And later she saw the same, same creature. And she'd come out onto the front porch. I, that, that really started it there as a disappearance of our animals. And, uh, this, this thing was, uh, it was more than one. It would come up to our, right up to our farmhouse and would shake our doorknob, you know, and scream and holler and make all kinds of racket. And so what followed was basically 11 months of, uh, terror from being harassed by these creatures. Of course, at that time, did you know it was a Bigfoot, or had you heard much about these creatures at oh, no. that point? No, we had heard nothing, nothing about these things. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, months and months later, uh, we were all sitting there, and I remember my mom and dad, you know, thinking and asking each other, well, what can this be? You know, they would come up with all kinds of, of things that were uh, kind of crazy, but never did anybody say Bigfoot. I had never heard of the word Bigfoot before, and I'm sure my mom and dad hadn't either. So we, we, we had no knowledge at all before this that these things, you know, were called Bigfoot. So this all started with the chickens disappearing. How, how many chickens do you think you right. had to this? All this information that I, that I give, not all, but anything that I don't recollect personally, I've spoken to my dad. I was blessed for, to uh, live with my dad for the next 19 years, and we spoke about the Spotsville Monster all the time. And he told me, uh, you know, exactly what happened, exactly the sequence of events that happened, what was said and all that. And that's what I I used to, uh, that I've used in my books and that I've written, his mm-hmm. recollections and my own. And he told me that it was over 200 chickens had disappeared before, you know, during the 11 months. Now, we never did find any of the chickens, Will, uh, just maybe a feather here and there. But the other animals had disappeared. Uh, we had a goat that disappeared, and it was found by the neighbor that lived down the road. 
And he said it was ripped to pieces. None of it was eaten. It was just ripped to pieces. And uh, we found a pig one day. That was my mom and us kids who were driving to town. And we was had a, about a half a mile long driveway. And down at the first curb, there was a pig. So on the way back home, we stopped and looked at, looked at it. And it was exactly like the dog carcasses that my brother and I were finding. We were all together in, in the last eight months or so. We found eight carcasses of dogs, and each one of them were totally eviscerated and exsanguinated, and nothing, uh, no meat eaten, uh, nothing gone but the entrails, the eyes, and the tongue, and the blood. And the strange thing about that is they, they took forever to decompose because not so much as a fly would land on these carcasses. Mm-hmm. And I remember, you know, riding in a school bus probably for two or three months and every day, you know, everybody, every kid on that bus would see these, this one dead dog that was laying in the roadside ditch. And it just took forever to decompose. So, you know, that's, uh, we had a, a, a pony that my uncle had given my youngest sister. And her name was Dolly. And she was, uh, strangled to death one night. And, uh, I remember my older brother having to go bury her the next day. And, you know, my, my little sister, of course, was just crushed that it happened, but, and, uh, that, that's about it. That's, he killed just about every animal we had, but except for our two dogs, and we had two dogs, Will, that were so vicious that no one would come up to our property, not even close family friends, and get out of their car until one of us came out and got the dogs out off of them, because they'd immediately go run to the car and, you know, stand there at the door and bark and just wait for somebody to open up the door and, you know, they would try to eat them. But to the family, they were beloved pets, and they were really gentle. But to anybody else, they weren't. But these things, how we knew that this creature was coming around, was these dogs, we could hear them running up underneath the house. They had a little hole and underpinning it beside the uh, back door. We could hear their heads bumping on the floorboards. And we we were like, yeah. oh, oh, crap, here it comes. You know, and Dad would get the shotgun, and we'd all brace ourselves for another round of this uh, craziness that was happening to us back then. But these dogs, would, they would, they were so vicious that there was later rumors <laughs> that some boy named Spain hired was running around down in the Spotsville bottoms with plywood feet on. And I always had to laugh at that. It's, um, I've seen it several places. Several people have told me that. And, and I always said, well, I'll tell you what, if that Spain hired boy had come to our farm, there wouldn't have been anything left of him but the plywood feet. So it definitely wasn't a Spain hired dressed up in a fur suit, you know, pulling a yeah. hoax on us. You know, I used to hear people talk about that many years ago, you know, people being out there with uh, wooden feet on it. And I thought, you know, it would be a pretty good trick to run around with some plywood, strap your feet. I don't think it'd stick to your feet very long, no matter how wood <laughs> strap them on. And, uh, oh, and yeah, it would be convincing, you know, the tracks. Yeah, it's ridiculous. So, uh, this did you, this um, monster was definitely no hoax. Did you ever hear of any of your neighbors having animals missing? No, uh, I never, I never, we didn't know many of our neighbors. Our closest neighbor was about a half mile away. I don't remember any of the close farms or anybody coming up and telling us that we, they were missing animals, but evidently this thing was getting animals from some other location and bringing them to our property and doing their uh, business with them and just leaving them there. For what reason? I don't know, but that's well, you found obviously people. what was happening. You found other people's animals on your property too. Yeah, yes, that's that's all we found on our property was other people's animals. So you guys definitely felt your lives were in danger during this time period. Is that right? Oh yeah, yeah. This was uh, this was probably the most frightening time of all our lives, and it's the only time in my life that I've ever seen my own dad scared of anything. My dad was an exceptionally brave, brave man. He was never scared of anything, but when it came to the spot to a monster, they were so scared, Will, that him and my mother had decided that this was probably eight or nine months into the uh, ordeals that we were, we were having there. They decided to get us kids together, and they gathered us around the kitchen table, and, they, and my dad started talking, and he pointed to the to the wall there, and it was a five-gallon bucket, and he said, you know, there's a five-gallon bucket of kerosene I got there at the wall, and we could see the mop there, and he said, this thing is so big and powerful 
that I don't know what kept it from coming in that door. He said, that back door is not going to stop it if he wants to get in here. They could probably tear through it like paper. And he said, so me and your mom have been talking. We want to want to know what y'all, y'all's feelings are. If this thing comes into the house and I can't stop it with my gun or fire, then I'm just going to kick that bucket of kerosene over and light it and burn us all up and we'll all go to heaven together and, uh, instead of losing one member you know, of our family. He looked at us and said, could y'all live with the rest of your life knowing that that thing out there had grabbed your brother or your sister or me or your mother? Could y'all even live the rest of your life with that? And we said, no, we, we'd all rather just go to heaven at one time together. So that's how serious it was and how that's scared my father was. Pleasure. But uh, it all it all came to a head one day, Will. Our next door neighbor, he was kind of the my brother saw it really good, but the next door neighbor literally bumped into it in a barn one day, and he was the one that was really the hero of the situation because when this this thing would come up and it would start scaring us, you know, and, and messing with us, well, of course, a normal person would just call the state police. So the state police would come out there, but after two or three times, they wouldn't respond anymore. See, they would come out with their lights flashing down the half a mile long gravel road, and of course the creature would just melt back into the woods. And, you know, they would look around for a few minutes, whatever, and get back in their car and leave, and here it comes right back out again. And so after a couple of two or three calls, the state police refused to respond to any more monster calls. So... This guy had come walking up one day. My dad told me about this. And, uh, you know, he had his, he was walking in from one of the wooded areas. It was right there at the river. You know, we had woods on, on a couple of sides and the rest was barns and fields. They come walking up and asked uh, mom and dad if, uh, we'd had any trouble seeing anything un- unusual the day before. And we, they said no. He said, well, I just, I was just down there squirrel hunting and I've, uh, I've scared something up. And whatever it was, it was huge, and it was uh, covered in hair, and it ran away on two legs. And so he wanted wanted us to be aware of that. And the dad eventually became really good friends with this guy because when the, the state police refused to respond, he would have no choice but to call Roy, who told him to. He said, you know, anytime you need, need me, I just live a half mile up the road, just call me, and I'll come right down. So he would call Roy, and Roy would come. and you know, he'd stand out there with his gun, and depending on the severity of the occurrence that night, he would either escort us to our cars and out uh, out the road, or he would look around. With it, you know, one time he even stayed all night up on the roof of the house with his gun, uh, which didn't do any good. But he would be the one that would come and uh, get us out of that situation. And he had a run in with this thing that was uh, just only described as very atypical, you know, or most people, uh, I'm sure 99.5% of all Bigfoot researchers consider this thing a, a simply, quote unquote, a flesh and blood relic hominid. It, it seemed like this creature enjoyed killing. It seemed like it just wanted to kill to kill. There really wasn't, I mean, am I right in saying that? No, there was a, I would say not. Because it did, in all the animals we found, except for our horse, which was just strangled, in all the animals we found, all the uh, internal organs were taken, the eyeballs were taken, and the tongues were taken in each case. So I don't know why it would be harvesting these uh, organic materials like that, but I know that it did. And it would seem to me that if, if I were a 10-foot tall hairy, egg-like creature that I would be eating everything. I would spend all my time eating to support mm-hmm. my huge mass. But this thing did not. It, did, it didn't care to eat. It was just, it was just taking okay. it out. You know, I can't say that it ate the, 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 the matter that it took. All I, all I can say for sure was that it was all gone. So, yeah, as, uh, as far as killing to be killing, it definitely did that to our goat and our, and our pony. But the other animals seemed to be, uh, you know, killed for a reason. And maybe part of the reason was to warn us. I don't know. But they sure brought it up, brought the animals up, and laid them right there for me and my brother to see because we were all over that place. You know, the fields were covered with arrowheads. You know, there was an Indian mound there. 
and the river was right there, and it was it was just a great location. So all this stuff started happening, just ruined it for us, and eventually drove us out 11 months later. Let me ask you, what was the creature doing beyond killing the animals? What type of behavior did you see a lot that kind of amplified the situation? It walked up on my dad one time uh, while he was in the – see, we raised eight, eight acres of tobacco when we were there. And he was in one of the tobacco fields up in front of the house while everybody else was in one of the fields down below the house. And it walked up on him boldly. Which, of course, it could have killed him, uh, but it didn't. But it was enough to really, you know, think, hey, you know, our lives could be in danger here. And it would, it would scream and holler at night, you know, it wouldn't give us any peace at all. So it was, uh, and, and that coupled with, uh, what our neighbor had, had been experiencing because he started experiencing these things almost as soon as he started looking for this. And it all ended because he told my father one day, it was 11 months later, and, you know, we're and still with a kerosene jug bucket beside the door. And he asked me, so, Roy, uh, do you honestly think that this thing will come up here and try to take one of my kids? And Roy told him, he said, well, Red, I don't think it will because you've lived here 11 months and it hasn't yet. But one thing's for certain, if it does, there would be nothing in the world that anyone can do to get your kid back. Your kid would just be gone forever. And mm. this thing is, is something beyond what we know. Uh, I've never seen anything like it, and uh, there would be no chance of getting anybody back if it did decide to take someone. And so that was enough for my mom and dad. You know, they started looking for a place immediately, and within a week or so, we were out. Did your dad describe what he saw? And can you give a description if you got a clear view of the creature. Can you describe what you saw and maybe what your dad saw? Okay. Well, my dad didn't see anything because he had glaucoma. and uh, But he did hear it, and it started growling from a distance and walking toward him, and he thought at first that it was some some type of airplane or something. But then when it got really, really close, and the dog, which was there with him, one of our dogs, uh, Poncho and Lad was what were our dog's name, and it was a a collie and a uh, just a, a big bird dog, but uh, they took off running with the tail between their legs, and that's how he knew it. Uh, my brother saw it really good in broad daylight, and I'll never forget it. I'll never forget the way he screamed when he looked up and saw this thing. But he said it was about eight or nine foot tall, covered in hair, said it had close set eyes and a square jaw, and he used a reference of a TV show that was on at the time. <laughs> how old I am. The Rifleman, have you ever heard of that with Chuck Chuck Connors? I don't suppose anyone's ever heard of that show, huh? Right, right. They used to see it as a kid. Well, that's what he said, that he had a square jaw like Chuck Connors of the Rifleman, covered in reddish brown hair, and he said it was uh, patchy and gray tinged like it was old, like it was an old creature. Mm-hmm. My mother saw, she saw basically the same thing, about an eight-foot-tall, hairy, kind of man-like creature, and that's what... Roy described too, but the one Roy saw on the first occasion was more, he said it had a, a short muzzle and it had fangs and claws. Sounds like so a what, freeze. Right. So what we're, what we're dealing with here is at least two different types of creatures in the same area at the same time. There's actually four types. Well, we had at least two there. Barton, why did your dad describe it? as an airplane sound? It was a, a low, constant growl. Mm. And it didn't stop. It just kept getting closer and closer and closer. And then finally he realized mm-hmm. that it was not an airplane and it was come, someone was coming at him and then he ran. And I remember <laughs> we were in the field and I remember hearing the shotgun going off two or three times. And I remember everybody, adults first, they ran out of the field, started running toward the house. We got there, and there was Dad, uh, he, and he was all shaken up, kind of, you know, and we had one of our nieces who, were, who was in the house, and he had run in the house following the dogs, and he grabbed her up, and he said, Stacy, can you see that thing out there? And she said, yep, how I see it? And she, he goes, well, where is it? And so she pointed. She, see, she said, it's running that way, and he just fired in the direction that it was running. So he never actually saw the creature. Gosh, it's terrifying. 
One thing I wanted to ask you, you had mentioned that you and your brother were surrounded by them. Yeah, that's a whole different occasion 10 years later. Oh, really? You saw him in... after... Oh, yeah. You know, well, the whole point was of that encounter was we didn't see him. Uh, <laughs> well, it was it happened at Smith Mills at a place called Burbanks Lake. And this was in the mid-1980s. And we'd always heard, you know, our whole life was Burbanks Lake and Burbanks Lake. It's got the biggest bass, you know, ever. Monster bass in there. So we, we always wanted to go fishing there. We just decided that we was going to do it, even though it was, it was, uh, no trespassing, so we'd have to sneak in. But we, we took a little one man bass boat and about five or six of us loaded up in the, in the car and in the station wagon and off we went to Burbanks Lake and we snuck in this place. And it was really, really creepy immediately. This is the same, same county, uh, Henderson County. But it was, the, the lake was situated, uh, between two old graveyards and just plumb full of water moxins. You know, every, every step we took, we had to be really careful because we've seen so many snakes there. And of course, you know, everybody's fishing on this side of the lake and we're wanting to fish on the other side. We think that the monster bass are on the other side. So my brother starts ferrying us across the lake one by one on this one man bass boat. And it took like 30 minutes, one way trip to get across the lake with two men on that bass boat. But he finally got us all over there and it was a bad day. Really, uh, I was the only one that caught anything. It was only like a two pound bass and I got a, I got a damn lure stuck in my jaw. That's why it's so memorable. Another reason. That's I got a three pronged bass lure stuck in my jaw and it had to be extricated. But to make a long story short, uh, me and my little brother were the last ones over there and it was getting dark. And my brother, you know, he was off carrying another one of the, uh, guys that was there across. And dark was coming really fast, so and it just rained for two or three days before this happened. And I, I had a half a jug of kerosene, which proved really useful in both getting the lure out of my face and uh, mm. building this little bit of fire. It was a pitiful fire that I had. I was gathering up some, you know, some small sticks uh, so I could get burning, and poured the kerosene on the pile and started, and I just lit it when you know darkness was there. And, we had a little fire and we was waiting for my brother and all of a sudden we started hearing these tree breaks. I mean, so loud. It was just incredibly loud. And immediately both me and my brother knew what it was. I don't know how, but it's like, you know, when you, when you uh, have an encounter with one of these creatures, your body automatically reacts in a certain way, whether it's fight or flight or it's uh, paralysis or it's, you know, whatever. But your body reacts to being in close proximity to these things. For us, it was, we knew immediately that it was one of the, the Bigfoot monsters and we were scared out of our minds immediately. And I'm not one to be scared of anything much, you know. I, I faced death on, on several occasions. I never remember feeling fear like I felt when these, these beings were close. But the tree branks, you know, is just solid blackout by now. The tree branks were getting, uh, Closer and closer, and we were surrounded on three sides by these sounds of breaking limbs. And the, the, behind us was the lake, down the hill to the lake, which was infested with water moccasins. But uh, the, we, we really thought we were going to die because they just kept getting closer and closer and closer. And I would wait till they got within, I'd say, you know, 10 or 15 feet. And I would take that cursing, I'd throw it in that little fire, and it would flare up. And we'd give us light for like 50 or 60. Maybe 70 feet, just in an instant, you know. And I thought we, I, I could, I was going to at least get to see what was getting ready to kill us. But when that, when I threw that fuel into the fire and it lit everything up, there was nothing there. Soon, well, you know, the kerosene only lasted like 20 or 30 seconds. And as soon as it died out again, here come the sounds again. And they were getting closer and closer and closer. And I let them get even closer within 10 feet before I threw the next batch of kerosene into the fire. Well, the, the fire flared up and nothing. We couldn't see anything around us. And this happened three or four times. And finally, I was out of kerosene. And I told my brother, I said, get ready, because we're getting ready. We're going to have to swim for it. So I had a little a little stick with a flame on it, about two inches tall. And I grabbed the stick up, and we started backing down to the lake. You know, and these sounds were following us. 
And I'm telling you, it was so loud and right there on us. Even there was a, even in places where there were no trees, with these sounds of tree breaks. So we got down, we backed down to the water's edge, and about that time, my, we heard our brother holler, "Hey, who's next?" And of course, you know, we were like, "Ah, get over here, hurry, hurry!" And uh, he got over there, and just in the nick of time, it seemed like, and. He said, what, what the hell's going on over here? You know, what's all that fire about? I said, I said man, I'll tell you later. He says, get out of here. He goes, well, yeah, only one of you can go at a time. <laughs> I said, bull crap. Oh, he was, he Ain't was nobody saying over know. this style. Like, we're both going. He said, there's no way, Bubba. There's no way this boat can hold three people. It's a one man boat. It's a little sink. I said, let's, let's give it a shot. <laughs> so, so we all three go on the boat and it took like an hour, over an hour to get to put our way across that lake, but I was never so glad to get away from some places as I was Burbank's Lake. Were you old enough to remember, or did your dad tell you the story about them getting up on the roof and shooting at the creature as it was coming out oh, of the no, barn? Oh, no, I remember. No, I remember that like it was yesterday. And the reason I remember it is because when this thing, when Dad had called all these people together, it, this, this had been happening regularly, almost every night, so we had four, five, or six people there up on the roof, and they were all armed with shotguns and rifles and pistols. And these weren't, these are, you know, we're Kentuckians. We know how to hunt, and we know that a shotgun, at, it's, it's only good at pretty close range, but it, the, the, the thing that they saw and heard was not at the barn. It was at the tree line right across from the house, and that was only like 20 feet away from the house to the left. The nearest, actually the nearest building that was close to us was a little smokehouse. And that was about, about 30 feet, uh, in front of the house. And then a barn about 40 more feet away from that was a big old barn. But <coughs> they got up on the house and they were sitting there, sitting there. And I, and I remember this quite well because I'd put a poker into the fire, uh, you know, a, a fireplace poker and was heating it up in case I needed it. You know, I'm nine years old, and I'm thinking about self-defense. Yeah. Wow. Because I couldn't have a shotgun. <laughs> so, so they're all up there, and, you know, they're, it's like they they're, they stay for two or three hours, like, oh, man, nothing's going to happen. It's crap. You know, nothing's going to happen. Their wives are down in the kitchen, and mom and dad is in the kitchen. My dad never got up on that roof. He had glaucoma. He could not see that well at all. So, of course, he wouldn't have any business up on a roof at night with five or six other people with guns. So when this thing, when it all broke loose, this, they was up there and they were just about ready to give up. It was probably, I don't know, nine or 10 o'clock maybe, and they'd been up there for a few hours, and all of a sudden they heard this dog yelp out. And they, they saw this pair of eyes, eye shine, and a low growl. It was just a bone-chilling growl, and we could hear it inside the house. And as soon as that thing growled out, and it sounded like World War Three going on up on our roof. There were so many gunshots going off, and they weren't using bird shot. They were using deer swords in the shotgun. So, <laughs> if, 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 surely they hit it. There was there were so many gunshots. It scared them all so bad, even though you know they were well armed. My older brother Harold, he was one of the ones up there. My bro, my cousin Bruce was one of the ones. But my older brother Harold was sitting on the eve in a chair. And when he was shot, he fell back and kicked the ladder off. And the ladder, they didn't have any way down. And another guy that lived down the road was friends with my mom and dad. I still remember his name, but I, I won't say his name. Uh, he shot and did the same thing and rolled off the front of the house and landed in the front yard. And here he comes knocking on the front door trying to get in, but it's locked. <laughs> so uh, yeah, my uncle just arrived, and he had brought with him a sheet. He had a sheet folded up. With a huge bundle in, in the middle of I'm like, what in the world was that? And he was carrying shotguns and, you know, a couple of rifles, and he got them all down in the kitchen. And my, as soon as they yelled out and started firing, my dad said, get out there, Robert, get out there. Get that ladder back up, get out there. And he, he couldn't, what he had in his cheek was a, probably about 40 different sized pistols of different calibers. And he could not decide which gun to take. He kept grabbing one and going around the door and then, Running back and grabbing another one, running back to the door. Dad said, "Hell, just get out there, <laughs> get that ladder." And they're all screaming and hollering on the roof, and this other guy's beating on the front door. And it, 
calamitous. But the poker I had in the fire, about 10 minutes before that, my dad had told me, son, take that poker out of the fire. So I took it out. And when that thing growled out really loud and everybody started shooting, I reached back behind me, was going to pick it up, and I grabbed the wrong end. So I grabbed the, the hot end of the poker, and it burnt my hand pretty pretty badly. And that's why I remember that night like, so well. Oh, man. But they, they finally got out there and got the ladder back up. Everybody comes down in the house. Everybody's scared. The crap just scared right out of them. And uh, they, want to lo- they want to leave. Everybody wants to leave, and we want to leave. So we all jump in the car, and we go to our grandmother's for that night. Well, the next night we come back, and uh, the guy next door is down, and he goes to where that thing growled out, and there's the, the carcass of a dead dog. Exactly as my brother and I found the other ones, you know, gutted, had an incision from its throat all the way down between its legs, its hind legs, no guts, no eyes, no tongue, no blood, no creature, wow. no blood of any type, even though, you know, there must have been 50 or 80, 50 to 80 gunshots go off within the next, within two minutes, and it had to hit this creature, but there was no blood and there was no creature. So that, that yeah, that's how that, that happened. I was just wondering, you know, from a kid's perspective and your daily life, you know, like how did it affect you living like that every day, you know, as far as your sleeping and your eating and your trying to be normal and going to school, oh, what's that yeah. like? Well, you know, kids are, are pretty tough, <laughs> but <clears throat> they're not that tough. And uh, it didn't really bother us all that much. You know, we still got hungry. We still ate when we got hungry and, and everything like that. But the, the thing that is, we had an outhouse. We didn't even have running water in the house. No bathroom in the house. So if you wanted to use the bathroom, you had to go outside to do it. And the outhouse was right next to the weeds. And uh, one one day, my brother, you know, he had to use the, use the outhouse. And he goes in there and sits down. On, on it, and he, there's a cracks in the boards. You know, it's just an old country outhouse. And he looks through the cracks and he sees this big hairy arm. He just reaches out and grabs a big handful of weeds. And just squeezes on me so he could see the, the juice from the weeds running running down his hand and everything. Well, he came out of the house, the little outhouse, with his pants down. Told told my mom and dad, and we went out there, and there was uh, we could see the weeds, but that was it. But as far as affecting us goes, it never affected us a whole lot until after the newspaper crew came down, uh, which was the day after the. TV crew came down. They'd heard this. They had on their police band radio. Uh, monster calls. Monster calls coming from uh, Mallory's Row. So the next thing you know, the TV crew comes up and does a a little segment on it, which which they thought was real, you know, fun, and funny. And they put a little uh, stuffed chimp in a toy cage and put uh, the spots of a monster on it. Oh. And after that. Uh, everybody in school really started, really started, uh, the ridicule. And Roy, the neighbor down the road, was, uh, in, in the fire department and he was getting it just as bad, if not worse, than we were. Because right after that, the, uh, the newspaper comes out. Well, they, of course, they see it on the news, they have to do a story. And they send, you know, a crew out and they take pictures and write the story up and then, Everybody, everybody in town, you know, knows what's happening, and it's uh, it's it's pretty funny to them. Well, it's really, really serious and, and life-saving to us. So after that, we was affected pretty good. I got in, in a few fights, and so did my brother. And, you know, it's just uh, you know, common kid things. But psychologically, I don't know. Maybe it kind of shaped uh, my future in a sense that, and in 1985, I started really to get into this cryptozoology really serious and I started uh, doing field investigations, going in, uh, talking to eyewitnesses, uh, doing uh, sketch renderings of what they've seen and not only Bigfoot but all manner of uh, unidentified uh, phenomena here in Henderson, Kentucky. Uh, I want to go back a little bit and ask about about the animals that were killed. Uh, Mm -hmm. When they had had portions of them missing, eyes, tongue, things like that, did it appear that they were torn out or removed some other way? Well, you know, I was only nine. Uh, is this Will I'm talking to now? Right, right. Okay. I was only nine, Will, but 
uh, and you, know, you don't have a real analytical mind at nine years old. You have more of an impressionable mind. But I can tell you for certain that the incisions made, uh, they always started right at the neck, top of the neck, continuing on down between the hind legs. They were made, it looked like they were cut. They were not ripped open. Uh, they were not shredded. They were uh, nice, neat cuts. And, you know, you know, we just took sticks and opened up the cuts. You can see there's no guts in there, and the mouths are wide open. You can see there's no tongue in there, and there's no eyeballs in there. And, right. you know, I didn't really examine uh, any further than that. I didn't really – I never touched any of the, of the carcasses. But some told me that, you know, we shouldn't touch them. And I was probably, you know, in the right by, by thinking that. Okay. The reason I ask is uh, a friend of mine in Portland, Oregon, many years ago, uh, was an investigator in cattle mutilation phenomena that was going on. And many uh -huh. of the aspects you talk about uh, or describe are sort of in that category, you know what I mean? Sure. The, the specific sure. organs missing, no blood, uh, the incisions, all and so forth. And right, yeah. our government insider friend, Mr. Black, told me that Oftentimes, when areas were where, where there was Bigfoot activity going on, that they would use the cattle mutilation phenomenon as a cover for that Bigfoot activity. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of wanted to throw that in. Okay, well that's that's it, strange, and it, uh, it, we certainly never saw any strangers around our house that would that would be right. capable well, of uh, this way to cover and discredit. Uh, you know, witnesses that were seeing these things. Throwing one mystery on top of another, I don't know how that, I guess it does, you know, blind you to, to what's going on, you know, on what the left hand know what the right hand's doing type thing, but there were certainly no strangers that we ever saw down at our house, and if anybody drove up, and they didn't, they just, the road went down for about another, maybe a little bit less than a quarter mile, and it ended at the river, but if anybody drove up, our dogs would be on them, you know, they'd be chasing a car, and so I, I seriously doubt anyone ever got out in the 11 months that we lived in Basket. I doubt that anyone ever got out of their car without us being there, at least one of, one of our family being there. Right. The only, the only other possibility is we know that the government sent special forces teams out occasionally to get these things, the violent ones, and you would never see those folks. Yeah. Well, they missed one. I'm here to tell you, Will. They missed one in 1977. I mean, it it it, it what didn't show violence toward us. It just showed aggression, but it sure showed violence toward our animals. Right, right. I remember one time we were walking and uh, we walked down this ridge, and there was a little swamp, you know, swamp area there, but it was dry. And so we walked out onto it, you know, we were looking for arrowheads on the, up on the ridge, but we we were still, you know, not so scared there. And at the end, we were too scared to go out in the fields, but. Right there in the middle, we were still, you know, we were still kids, and damn it, we were going to arrowhead hunt no matter what. And uh, I saw a little pile of bones laying there in a, in a nice, neat little pile. I'm like, wow, look at this. And uh, we also found a cave made by where well, they cleared the fields of uh, driftwood and trees and just bulldozed it all up together in a, in a huge pile that ran the whole length of the tree line at the edge of the field. My, me and my brother found a cave there and we were crazy i guess you know stupid more likely but we went up in this cave and it was probably five or six foot tall and probably four or five feet wide and dad had always told us you know my dad was extremely smart he said don't you ever see a kind of cave or anything like that it looks like a you know a nest or, or or a cave or any kind of thing resembling something that this place, this thing might live or go. Don't ever go there. He said, you get away fast. You know, don't, don't ever go inside. And the first thing we did was walk inside. You know, we walked in for like four or five feet till we couldn't see anymore. So if this thing wanted us, it could have just grabbed us immediately and no one would have ever known. Right. But right. it didn't. And but, so we, we went back home and the next morning at breakfast, we were talking about it and my brother let it slip about the cave we found. And immediately my dad looked up and said, what cave? You know, like, oh, crap. Yeah, we got to come clean now. Okay. We found this cave, Dad. You know, it was a, it was a supper that, that night, not at breakfast next morning. A supper that night. And he, he said, what what cave? And we told him about it. 
He said, well, we're going to go look at it tomorrow morning. As soon as it, as soon as the sun, you know, as soon as the morning comes, we're going to, we're going to go check it out. But when the morning came and we all went down there to look for that cave. Guess what? It was completely gone. There was nothing there but dirt. So this thing had evidently heard us. It was listening to us speak and went and erased the cave. And that's just, this was, the Spotsville case is so strange and bizarre. It's probably one of the most bizarre cases ever. Uh, all the things that happened, you know, and I've wrote a lot of them down in, in, in my books, but I haven't by any means wrote everything, every aspect of the case down, and uh, I might just do that. Uh, Barton, there was one detail that I had brought up with your mother, and it was the fact that, you know, when you guys first even walked into the house, you went to the back door, and there were holes in the screen yes. um, where with the previous yes, Shannon. renter. Yes, well, let me tell you, that this is my mother, she's she's in her 70s, and she's just been diagnosed with uh, Parkinson's disease, and I don't know if that affects her memory, but I talked to her the day before yesterday, and I listened to the show last week, and I finally got to listen to the show, and I was really surprised and shocked at things that she remembered and didn't remember, and the things that she remembered, some of those weren't accurate at all. But it's, you know, it, it, it's all a matter of perception. She wasn't where I was at when this if this happened, or I wasn't where she was at. So everybody remembers different things. But mm-hmm. my dad told me that story, and I, and I was I was actually there. For that but he had ushered us out of the house when this this subject was discussed, and I, I remember it was the first day we came there. It was a light snow on the ground, and we were coming to look at the house. We we're going to move in it, and we we got to the we parked our car. He had vicious dogs too, so he had to come out and usher us in. And we were going in the back door. The screen door had wooden slats nailed across it, all across it. And of course, we, you know, when we got, went inside and he shut the door, we could see that there were nailed across holes. And I remember my dad, he said, the guy's name that lived there was Buzzy. He said, Buzzy, what, what's uh, the deal with your door there? Why are all those holes in your door and you got it boarded up like that? And he uh he told his oldest daughter that uh he that she needed to take us kids out and build some snowmen or something, you know, just to get rid of so they could talk about that. But my dad later told me exactly what he said and he, he told me this story many times I know exactly what was said. Buzzy he, he said, Well Red, once we got out, he said, Well Red, I was sitting there in the kitchen this last summer and I was sitting at the table and I had my twenty two rifle right there behind me leaning on the door jam in the kitchen and I had my back to the door and he said the hair on my neck just stood straight up and I knew something was watching me and so I turned around and there standing out in the yard is this big hairy fella and he's about eight or nine foot tall and covered in hair and he's just standing there looking at me and he said so I just grabbed my gun up I was there by myself I grabbed my gun up and I emptied it out that back door he said, that's why those holes are there. So I want to tell you in front of your kids, you know, I don't want to scare nobody, but there's this big, tall, hairy man, and I, I shot at him. And he said, after I shot, and eventually, I, he said, I don't even remember him running off. I just kept squeezing the trigger even after the, the bullets ran out. But eventually this thing ran off. He said, I don't know what in the hell it was. And my dad, oh. like I say, he's, he's extremely, uh, uh, I don't know, powerful and uh, confident, you know. And he didn't care about it. He said, well, we're not, we don't, we don't care about any big hairy fellas. He says, I got a couple of dogs that eat a hairy fella right up, and if that don't work, this 12 gauge shotgun would take care of him where you're 22 would miss. I'll hit him with my 12 gauge. And they just kind of laughed it off. But mm-hmm. that's the story of that. And I know wow. my mom didn't quite remember it the same, but. That is that is exactly how it happened and what was said and why the door was boarded up. Well, I wanted to uh, promote your books, Bart. You have Mysterious Kentucky and the Bigfoot in Kentucky. Right, yeah. The Mysterious Kentucky and and Bigfoot in Kentucky are also available on Kindle for really really cheap. So you guys, you know, get your copy of that and read it up. Yeah, I'm gonna get awesome. the two Bigfoot books. I can't wait to check them out. I appreciate that. Well, we appreciate it, Burton. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Thank well, you. That's no problem. Yeah, thank thanks, you again. Pleasure.
You're welcome, Shannon. It was a pleasure. I'm sorry if I rambled on too too long about some things. No. It was I, awesome. I get pretty passionate about this stuff. And... <laughs> yeah. So. No, I hear you there. All right, you're welcome, Wes. You guys have a good evening. Thanks for having Thank me you. on. Good one. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Shannon. See you, Willie. Y'all have a good one. Bye bye. All right, you too. Not really a whole lot going on in the Bigfoot world, is there? No. It's quiet right now. There's another Bigfoot movie coming out, another one called Stomping Ground. I just saw the oh, trailer boy. for it. I sent it to you, uh, Wes. Yeah, it's uh, another Bigfoot movie. I was like, oh my goodness, it? it's so hot right now. Yeah, what is it with all these movies all of a sudden? I don't know. And I did post a really cool video of, um, he's called like a Native American Watchman or something, and he was just chatting for like four minutes about Bigfoot. And he's just real down to earth about it, and he's, you know, he's just like us. He's just like, it's a, it's a huge unknown primate that's just really intelligent and Master disguise and all that, and it was really cool to hear him talk. People enjoyed that video. Yeah, I saw that video. It's pretty interesting. It's a pretty interesting yeah, like, it's video, cool, right? Early two thousand period, I had a floating native gift store in my home for my young child and my common law wife at the time, over in Village Island, catering to the tourists. And I was stirring soup on the stove, and this two kayakers walked into the float house, and the woman goes. What throws rocks out here, bears or squirrels? And it got my attention, so I asked her, what are you talking about? And she goes, oh, we're camped over on Turner Island at this peninsula. I said, yeah, I know the place. And she goes, we're sitting in a little structure. I said, yeah, there's like a lean-to frame on the beach, on the white shell beach. And she goes, we're watching the stars sparkle and reflect on the calm water. And all of a sudden, we could hear little pebbles, rocks being thrown from the trees behind us and splashing. Ba-dum, ba-dum. And she goes, we were wondering what it was. And I said, well, nothing throws rocks out here except for humans and Bukwus, the wild man of the woods, the male Sasquatch. And it's one of their traits. It's a primitive, it's a primate characteristic that Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall established back in the sixties with primates that when threatened or curious, they'll throw rocks. And if they're really threatened, they'll shake foliage or they'll push over dead foliage. And it's documented with chimpanzees, mountain gorillas, orangutans, monkeys, that they do these primate characteristics and acts when they feel threatened. And, of course, if you correlate that to Sasquatch Bigfoot sightings, it's rampant. It's across the board. So what is Bigfoot? It's nothing more than North America's undiscovered great ape. But it's also found in Europe, Asia, even down in the South Pacific, Australia. They call it Yowie and so forth. But out here we call it Bukwus and Junukha. And when I told that lady about what I thought it was, she got scared. And I said, look, ma'am, I said, I'm a watchman. I'll go grab your tent with your husband, put it in the boat, and we'll bring you over to our village island. You can camp on the dock. And she said, oh, thank you. I want to do that. But when we came here, of course, I went and looked behind the campsite here, and I found a tree snap. It was about that high where something had grabbed a small spruce tree, busted it, and twisted it. A human can't do that. And it wasn't snow damage. It was fresh. It had been done within a few hours. So that's another primate characteristic, especially of the North American Bigfoot, that they do tree staffs. They also do, like, primitive lean-to shelters and nests. So if you do come across something like that, do I believe in that creature? Of course I do. It's like a white blackberry. You spend enough time out here, you're going to see it. I have heard them. I have seen them in the spotlight of my sane boat, not a quarter mile away from here in Native Anchorage in 1994. It's well documented in Dr. John Bindernagel's book, North America's Undiscovered Great Ape, the Sasquatch, about my encounter with three of my crew men on board and we put a spotlight on, and there, 100 yards in front of us, this big, huge human, boom, dropped on its knee. And then the female dropped on its knee and bent like that. And for 20 minutes with my spotlight, we watched these two creatures, but I could see reflection of eye, two eyes, one eye, like something was breathing with its arm in front of it. And when we bring the dance of the bakwus, the wild man of woods, to life in our big ceremonies of potlatch and other events, you'll have a costume dancer with a fur-covered costume, a mask that looks like this ape, and when you dance it, you're down low like that. 
And that's what the Bokwes is said to be like when you see it. It's always hiding behind its hair-covered arm. And at times you can hear them out here. And what you're listening for is... They chirp when they communicate back and forth. And when they holler, they're whoop, 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 when they call back and forth from one to another. And if you don't believe in it, come stay out here in October into November when the clams get good. And I guarantee you, you're going to believe in something that, does this, that doesn't just snap, crack, pop in the bush at night. They may even come down and shake some foliage for you if they feel threatened. They may take a stick and bang it against a tree. Bang, 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 bang. And us aboriginals, when we're taught hunting skills, as I taught my son and others, when you hear that banging of a tree, you stop, turn around, and go back where you came from. That's the Bukwes telling you, my family's here. I don't want you coming further. What happens if you go further? Well, just go on the internet and look about missing people who went camping and kayaking. There's always one or two that didn't break their leg or get hypothermia and die or have a heart attack. There's always that small percentage of people that probably didn't heed the warning of the bus and they went further in. And of course, when you're 700 pounds to 1,000 pounds and you're a bipedal animal with arms about that thick, well, personally, I wouldn't want to piss them off. That was Native Watchman Tom Seward uh, discussing the Sasquatch. Definitely an interesting video. Uh, I got that video off of Bigfoot Evidence online. So if you get a chance, head over there, watch the video. It's definitely an interesting video to watch, and, and he has a lot of great information that he's sharing. I wanted to remind our fans, we're shooting for November 1st for the Sasquatch Chronicles website to go live. So we hope you go and check us out and support us in our endeavor in expanding the show. If you feel so inclined, please like us on our Facebook fan page under Bigfoot Hotspot Radio. This coming Wednesday, we have a special midweek show where we'll be talking with a witness that goes into full detail about seeing a Sasquatch face to face as it was peering in through a window. Um, And he's had a few other encounters that were pretty interesting, but it's definitely a show you won't want to miss. Next Sunday, we'll be talking with a witness from an Indian reservation. She goes and shares a lot of the native stories and encounters and experiences from the tribal land. It'll definitely be interesting to talk with her. I want to thank Bart for coming on the show. I want to thank uh, Andrew Bennett, John Johnson, and Jacob Smith. Uh, You guys went through, created a bunch of awesome artwork for us, and you posted it up on our Bigfoot Hotspot Radio group and also in the fan page where you go to like us. And I just want to thank you guys for for doing that. I mean, it it was awesome. I really do appreciate it. I know there's a lot of hard work that goes into it, and I really want to thank you guys for doing that for us and allowing us to use it. Until Wednesday, everyone, have a great night, and we will see you then. Smile.